Uh, okay. Uh, uh, welcome everyone. Um, so today, Creative Commons. Uh, so today I'm just gonna be talking about uh, differential analysis and uh, how to handle that for your newly called uh, Gypsy Peaks. Uh, ignore this a taxi part. Sorry. <laughs> um, moving on. So some of the learning objectives uh, I will try to cover today are what are the kinds of questions you can ask to better inform your analysis as you're um, looking at your Gypsy data. Um, there are a variety of ways to uh, perform your differential analysis. Um, one we've touched on, but I will go in more in depth is uh, doing uh, comparing it via genomic coordinates. So that's to identify overlaps and uh, elements that are not overlapping between your files. Um, so to do so, we are going to use uh, bed tools. Um, we will also include the context of uh, coverage and amplitude. Um, we will have to use a couple of tools for that, but uh, the main um, the main uh, statistical uh, driver for that would be uh, edge R. And then uh, we'll cover some, um, we will cover some ways we can handle triplicates. Um, the main one I'm going to be talking about is uh, diff bind. Uh, here's the pen, there you go. Uh, the pen is showing, right? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, the main one I will be going over is uh, defined in R package. Um, and then I want to take some time to highlight other considerations when we are uh, uh, analyzing our chip seek, just because sometimes it's not as straightforward as we would like. Um, and then I want to highlight some additional resources for you guys. Um, another tool called uh, Deep Tools, just uh, for QC or generating plots, and some existing uh, Chipseek pipelines out there that uh, you guys can leverage. Okay, so um, day one, uh, we aligned our, our, our reads, um, called our peaks, and then uh, we did some QC to remove, the, remove them, uh, blacklist, Black, sorry, remove the blacklist regions, and now you have your peaks. So what can we do with that? Um, in terms of analysis, there are two features that we can, or two analysis pathways we can do. Um, we can, uh, if you recall that your enriched regions are really just a set of coordinates, you can find those coordinates if they, you can find, whether your set of coordinates overlap. And you can also find whether your set of coordinates do not overlap. So they would be uh, considered unique to each condition. Now, the context of whether, of how to interpret overlap and your unique peaks vastly differ according to your model or experiment type. Um, what I mean by that is, let's go into the first example. So, Say your example, uh, for example A, your um, first set of files are acetylation for condition A, and your second set of files is K4 monomethylation for condition, for condition A. When we perform a overlap and find that we, what we are essentially getting is a bunch of regions that are enriched with both 27 acetylation and K4 monomethylation. So what does that mean? Well, what in uh, if you recall the um, the study that Martin highlighted, where they found um, uh, regulatory elements that had uh, certain histone marks, twenty seven acylation and K four monomethylation often co occur in region in uh, distal regulatory elements that we called active enhancers, and so active enhancers then uh, go on to affect promoters increasing transcription, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for unique peaks, what does that mean to have um, acetylation on its own that doesn't coincide with K4 uh, monomethylation? Well, uh, going back to that same paper, 
27 acylation can co occur with other marks at different uh, regulatory elements. Um, for example, 27 acylation can occur at uh, active promoters. Uh, so this, so in those promoters, they would also share with uh, K4 trimethylation. Um, they can also be bivalent promoters. So they could be at a location at a promoter where they share it with uh, 27 uh, trimethylation. Um, what does it mean for K4 monomethylation to be on its own? Well, uh, we've seen examples where K4 uh, would be a primed enhancer, and then following some change, it becomes active. Um, let's take a look at another example. What if we are comparing, say, 27 acylation across two cancer types? Well, if we find shared peaks, that would indicate that they perhaps share uh, common uh, regulatory elements, such as uh, uh, sh uh, shared enhancers or uh, shared activity at um, promoters. So that suggests that they have common mechanisms or re uh, regulatory pathways. Um, regarding unique peaks, uh, that could mean disease-specific 27 acylation. And to cover one more model, um, say you had a cell line that um, you then induce and uninduced for, um, I don't know, say like a transcription factor, for example. Um, and if you were looking at 27 acylation, um, shared peaks, shared peaks between your induced and your uninduced state would mean that your 27 acylation mechanics are independent of the treatment. But then if you find 27 acylation unique peaks, um, that would mean that your uh, one set of acylation was gained following the induction of your uh, transcription factor. And then a set of 27 acylation peaks was, follow was lost following the induction of your uh, transcription factor. Um, so really just to summarize all of that, um, the types of analysis we can do is to identify overlaps and unique peaks, um, but the interpretation of your overlap and your unique peaks will depend on your type of experiment. So just keep that in mind as you are asking questions and trying to formulate uh, a, uh, a, uh, ex a analysis around your experiment. So um, how do we identify, identify genomic overlaps? Um, you will find in a lot of papers, they have uh, a figure such as this, where it is a Venn diagram um, showing um, how many regions are exclusive to one condition, how many regions are exclusive to another condition, and how many regions are shared. How do we get to this point? Well, um, recall. Recall that your enriched regions are in bed format, and really what that is is a set of uh, genomic coordinates for each feature uh, between your two files. Um, so we can find the commonality or the overlap between your two files by using a tool called uh, bed tools. Um, I'll go into more detail about bed tools later. Um, so to identify the uh, commonalities, what we can do is just use the command uh, bed tools intersect, we would list our uh, first file by doing dash A, file A, and doing dash B, file B. That will give us the um, uh, the intersect, so the left outer join. So that would be the 61,000 and the 147,000. Um, if we were to do the same, but to, to switch um, our file A with file B, so the command would become bed tools intersect and we want to report the number of elements in file B that intersect uh, A. Oh, sorry, that's sorry. Let me try that again. Bed tools intersect dash A and file B. That would just give us the uh, overlap in the middle here. Uh, likewise, if we were to do the uh, identify the file B that overlaps file A, that would return us the intersect. So the uh, one hundred forty-seven thousand. Uh, adding dash V will alter the command. So instead of giving us returning, sorry, instead of returning us the uh, intersect of file A and file B, instead it will give us elements unique to file A that are not found in file B. 
So in this particular uh, example, bed tools intersect dash V dash A file A dash B file B. Um, this will give us the uh, 61,000. Um, now, the neat thing is file B can be any can be a variety of types of files. Um, it can be a set of uh, uh, it can be a bed file, so containing a set of coordinates. <clears throat> it can also be a BAM file. It can also be a VCF. So what that will give you is um, bed tools intersect um, that uh, file A and, oh, sorry, file A and file B. If file B was, say, a BAM, that will give you all the uh, regions that contained um, reads from your BAM. Or if you were turning uh, VCF, if or, sorry, if your file B was a VCF, that will give you all the regions that had a uh, that intersected with a VCF. Um, so one problem when uh, trying to generate this kind of an analysis that I would like to highlight is that your intersects are not always one to one. Um, take this example down here where. Um, this is your file A, this is your file B, um, and each of these blocks are eight elements from uh, each of the files. So we can see here that in file A, this particular, yeah, this particular block will intersect multiple blocks in file B. This will uh, affect how you count, because do you report this number relative to A, or do you report this number relative to B? Um, so one method to Oh, solve this issue is to um, merge your uh, merge your intersect together, and by merging, what I, what that means is uh, you take the uh, leftmost coordinate and then your rightmost coordinate and report this whole intersect or this whole uh, uh, section as a single element. And how do we do that? Um, we can do that through the additional features of uh, bed tools. Um, so bed tools is actually a really great tool that I hope that um, everyone will, will become uh, more accustomed to using as you are exploring and uh, learning how to perform uh, chip seek analysis just because it is so rich in features. Um, being a tool that can work on um, a bed file and a bed file can be really a set of genomic coordinates for anything. I think uh, bed tools offers a lot of uh, functionality. Um, the one um, feature that I mentioned was merge. Um, so given your set of bed, uh, bed files where you have uh, various um, uh, elements, and uh, you supply a file, it will then merge those elements into a single, merge elements that are overlapping into a single one. Um, if you provide it a certain uh, distance, th that can uh, also merge your uh, elements into a single one as well. It will also merge uh, bookended elements into a single one. So uh, very practical and useful. Um, another uh, function I would like to highlight is called a map. Um, so say if you had your file A, so this could be your enriched regions. And your file B, this could be, um, I don't know, uh, your uh, regions of, uh, regions of um, methylation, for example. Um, what map does is it takes the overlap from um, the uh, elements in B that intersect with A, and then can summarize the values that uh, accompany each of those elements. For example, uh, you can uh, and use that to calculate the mean methylation that co-occur uh, with A. So this allows you to um, combine your analysis with uh, other uh, epigenetics, such as um, uh, bisulfite. Um, and uh, one of the last uh, features I would like to uh, highlight for uh, bed tools is uh, the closest function. Um, so given file A, given file B, it will just report the closest element in proximity to your file A. Um, this has been extremely useful for me. Um, say, for example, you find an enhancer. Um, you have, but the problem is it's hard to contextualize what your enhancer is doing. 
Um, one common assumption is that your enhancer is uh, operating on a nearby TSS. And so using something like closest can then help you identify the closest TSS. Um, and just to highlight the um, interoperability of embed tools, it's available in command line, uh, which we will primarily be using. Um, you can download it through Conda. It has a wrapper in R, uh, Python, and it's also available in uh, Docker. Um, as I noted before, um, it's not just limited to your peaks, uh, as bed files could be any feature, uh, including um, plus or minus 2 KB of your uh, TSS. It could be exons, it could be methylated regions, it could be uh, TADs. Um, so you can do a lot to, manip to manipulate your files. Um, and it's also uh, good for uh, speedy uh, analyses. So one issue I would like to highlight when you're just doing um, a genomic overlaps is that they make very simplistic assumptions. So for example, here, I have uh, K, uh, K4 trimethylation for uh, two conditions. Um, the highlight I want to show is that in one condition, I have two peaks here, and then in, this, in the opposing condition, I'll have only one peak. The highlight indicates um, a peak that is supposedly unique to my above condition, but then if we check the amplitude in the tracks, um, that is not the case. Um, so this would be a false positive of a, following a binary comparison. If I were to do the same and uh, look at it in this scenario where, sure, uh, this peak and this peak uh, for the 27 oscillation for these two conditions, um, they are technically both present, but if we compare the height and the amplitude of the tracks, one is vastly higher than this one, than the other. Uh, I think this is also another uh, very obvious example. So the question then becomes, how do we uh, account for uh, difference in coverage, difference in amplitude? So to do so, um, you'll often find uh, analyses um, such as this, where your, where your X and your Y axes um, will be a signal and, or coverage or amplitude from each of the comp opposing conditions. Your, each of these dots will be a peak from a unified uh, peak call set. So that means we would take your um, peaks from file, peaks from the, this example, this wild type, and then peaks from your mutant, uh, read them together, uh, sort and merge them and to get a unified peak set. Um, we will then have to assign, because that's just um, a uh, bed file, we then want to convert that into a bed graph file, where we want the fourth column to be um, coverage and pileup information for, uh, for the X and the Y to uh, inform our X and our Y values. Um, to do that, we will use uh, bed tools, um, utilizing the feature of intersect and counting the number of uh, reads that intersect uh, each uh, element in our unified uh, peak call set. Um, once we do that, we basically have a data frame that we can then uh, read into R. Uh, once we read into R, we can apply a, uh, we can uh, find uh, differential peaks through a uh, full change. Um, we can supply it to um, other uh, statistical software that can apply normalization for library depth, for example, to, to, sorry, to account for library depth, for example, uh, such as uh, common, uh, sorry, commonly used ones such as uh, Edge R and DEC2. That will give us um, a combination of full change and a p-value, and then we can just apply and those uh, apply certain cutoffs, and then we would have the uh, differential all regions in red here and the differential regions in blue here. 
um, to highlight the um, potential of this of doing this particular analysis. If we were to just use uh, bed tools and only annotated the uh, regions that were exclusive based on uh, based on genomic coordinates, what we essentially get would would just be the um, regions on the y and the x axis. So we would be missing out on the context of all the, all this in between in along the eh, roughly along the diagonal. So to summarize how this workflow would look like, um, we start off with our peaks, we start off with our BAMs, we read our peaks into bed tools, and then we merge it to uh, get a unified peak set. Um, we then supply this peak set with our BAMs into bed tools, where we would enumerate each peak uh, with the number of reads that can be found there. Um, this produces a data frame, we can read that data frame into uh, R and um, use a statistical analysis package such as, such as edge R to calculate that. And then from there, we can just buy a threshold hold for um, either Q value or your full change. And then we get differential peaks and your other peaks. Um, moving on, uh, I would like to talk about uh, triplicates. So one strategy um, we can use is called a diff bind. So diff bind is a uh, wrapper essentially where, where um, after we get our, um, so assume each of these is a uh, experiment and um, each of these lines are a track and each of these bars is a pileup for each of your uh, replicates. We then perform a peak call with our, uh, say, max two. We get enrichment and enriched regions. So uh, in the red, what we will feed that all into diffbind. And what diffbind will do is similar as before, it will merge all our peaks across all our three replicates. Um, so you just get one set of unified peaks. It will also do the count for us, where it will count per replicate the uh, number of reads in each uh, peak, and then it will apply normalization and then perform a statistical test to give us the, uh, uh, in the statistically valid and full change uh, appropriate, sorry, full change, well, sorry, it'll calculate Q value for us, and then we can filter by full change in Q value similar as we did before. Um, some of the cons for using diffbind, for example, is we need uh, replicates, so more than three. Uh, the one problem is your merging can go poorly if your peak call wasn't great to begin with. And so this makes it hard, or at least your certain, sometimes your analysis with broad marks doesn't go according to plan, go according to plan. So uh, it might not perform that well. Um, but if you have three replicates, this is a great package to use. Um, it ha If you don't like the default uh, overlap function, it has other uh, overlap functions that you can use to uh, make it a bit more specific. And you can, uh, as a wrapper, it also has access to both edge R and DEC2. So you can use those to find your uh, significantly enriched regions according to your choosing. Um, regarding uh, edge R and DEC2, uh, I've mentioned them quite a bit. So I just want to give a refresher to those who are uh, not as familiar with it. Um, Granted, I'm not a statistician, so I might butcher some of these explanations, but bear with me. Um, so both are soft, both are software uh, very commonly used in uh, RNA seq. Um, they make the assumption that differ differential events are rare, so they follow a, a, bin a negative binomial distribution. Um, some of where they begin to differ is in their normally, sorry normalization methods in which uh, edge R uses something called trimmed mean of M values. 
it looks at each um, each sample and then tries to, in assuming the log ratio is one, given that nothing should be too different, uh, it then calculates the weighted mean of a log ratio per, uh, I believe it was each combination, and then scales it accordingly so that it is as close to one as possible. Um, for DEC2, uh, it does something similar where it uh, looks at each of your samples and within each of your samples also looks at uh, each gene and tries to uh, find where that gene is relative to all the other uh, samples in, a, in, a ter in terms of a geometric mean. And then it finds the median of that and then scales each lane accordingly to that uh, median ratio. Um, also in terms of uh, the type of statistical tests that Edge R does and uh, DEC2 does, uh, Edge R has uh, two functions. Um, if you are just comparing two groups, you get your um, Edge R performs an exact test. Um, as of late, if you are um, performing an analysis on multiple groups, um, Edge R uses a, uh, can use a generalized linear model. Uh, and then for DC2, it just uses a, a wall test. So um, again, just summarizing things. Um, say if you start your experiment, um, you can ask yourself, do you have triplicates? No, we can then go into the previously described uh, pipeline where we take our peaks, we merge them into a unified peak set. Um, we then uh, use a tool, use a tool to look at the uh, coverage for each of our BAM files in that unified peak set. We then create a data frame, supply that into Edge R, and then we do a. Uh, we can then uh, filter for significant and uh, reads. Uh, sorry, peaks of a certain full change. Um, diff bind is nice because it basically does all that for you, and you can call it an R. Um, Edmund, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Monica mm -hmm. has her hand up. Yeah, sorry. Monica. Just before you continue, um, like I use a chart for, for transcriptomics, but it's like my, my preference. Is there an, any reason why you prefer a chart here also for, for ChIP-seq or either way, like um, DSEQ to will work similarly? Or why do you prefer a, a chart here? Um, in this particular scenario, I'm just using Edge R because it works better for our, uh, for the, sorry, for the tutorial. Yeah, for the tutorial that we're about to go through, but really uh, you can switch that between a DC2 or Edge R. Um, I do believe DC2 only plays nicely if you have uh, triplicates or uh, at least more than, uh, uh, sorry, two or more uh, per group when you're doing your comparison. So if you only have two samples that you're comparing, uh, you might want to use edge R. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Good question. And before Thank we you. move on, I think there's a question in the Slack that um, Jose has answered, but he also says uh, he wants your opinion on uh, from Desmond. A bit of a theoretical question, but I recall Max2 assumes the chip seek data follows a Poisson distribution. Both, both Edge R and DE seek 2 assume the data adhere to a negative binomial distribution. Wouldn't this lead to a bias in the downstream data analysis, or does the NB models each package use is generalized to the Poisson when working with chip seek, or is this not even an issue? Um, hmm. I think my take on that is the two assumptions being made for um, max to chip seek calling is going to be a different assumption opposed to um, opposed to what edge R and DEC to assume because again. Yeah, that's 
sorry, go ahead. I want to interject what I answered, Edmund, but this is how I see it is, is that the assumption is being applied on different targets. So what Max2 is analyzing is reads. What edge are and the seek are analyzing are genomic features, whether they're peaks or something else. So the distribution is, it can be different distributions and still not be contradictory, right? The peaks can have one distribution, but the underlying reads can have a different distribution. I will say also that the the negative um, binomial distribution is like due to the next generation sequencing data per se. So that's why it's used now. Well, maybe just to interject, I mean, the negative binomial distribution works for, for expression, for gene transcript abundances. But, you know, does that model apply in the context of, of chip-seq distributions? Um, you know, I think that's, I, I haven't seen any evidence that that's the case. <clears throat> I, I think DE-seq2 is, I mean, DE-seq2 is designed for doing differential analysis across large groups of samples where you have you know many many me measurements tens or hundreds of measurements um and then it you know assumes a mean and and uses a negative binomial to provide a significance for the differential expression chip seek is a different beast because you almost never have that number of samples and so although the new version of deseq2 of course allows you to do a, a lower number of replicates um, I'm always very cautious in using DEseq2 for differential analysis, and, and prefer to use um, DiffBind or uh, or Deep Tools um, uh, to do to do any differential analysis that depends on amplitude. Um, I mean, this is a big discussion, and maybe maybe we want to work work through it. But but even thinking about what amplitude means in the context of chip seq data. What, what does amplitude mean? Amplitude is a reflection of occupancy of that mark within the population of cells that you're measuring. It's not a measure of strength in, in the sense that we think about it in gene expression. Amplitude in gene expression means that that gene is expressed more. Um, amplitude in chip seek means that more of the cells within your population have that mark at that particular position. And we have no understanding of what the minimum and maximum is. So even, you know, taking into account amplitude, I think you have to be very, um, very cognizant of, of the, uh, you know, of the biases in the data and the challenges there um, while, you know, while, while undertaking such an analysis. And I mean, I think the first step is to do a binary analysis with, you know, FDR cutoff peaks that you use um, that have been generated using a Poisson distribution. That would be my first um, approach, and I would be very cautious in using amplitude. But that's just my opinion, and and obviously this is a an area of of ongoing research and 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 development. Um, but uh, you know, you really need to think about what amplitude means in chip seek, which is different from transcript. Anyway, I'll I'll, I'll be quiet now. Edmund, please. No, definitely appreciate the input from everyone. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, moving on. Um, so another method to utilize your triplicates, if you don't want to um, call peaks of, on them individually and analyze them individually, um, what you can do, uh, so again, each of these tracks uh, would indicate a uh, separate uh, replicate, and each uh, colored bar would indicate the um, reads, corresponding reads there. Um, you would normalize for depth. And then you would just combine your three BAMs into a single one. And then you can perform the same uh, binary analysis as we have highlighted previously. Um, some pros and cons for this particular approach. Um, this particular approach allows you to use the same uh, strategies that we highlighted in the binary comparison. Um, one issue is it assumes that there is tight correlation between your replicates. So for example, in this uh, in this uh, crude drawing, you can see that one replicate is vastly different from the other two. So it may rep misrepresent what you are showing, or it may rep misrepresent some of your results. Um, so circling back to, um, the 
problem with uh, broad marks that I briefly talk, talked about. So when you're working with broad marks, um, the merging result can be get messy. For example, if you are uh, looking at trip, uh, triplicates here, if we were to merge that, you would essentially get this lo extremely large uh, feature. And, and, honest, and it's hard to say because maybe you do want something as big because um, 27 ME3 can look that large occasionally, but because of uh, Max2 and how it performs uh, broad peak calling, and it doesn't always have the, um, what's the best word to call it? The best resolution for uh, boundaries. Um, so some additional ideas I would like to highlight when uh, trying to wrangle your broad marks is that, like I mentioned, um, broad mode works, though it can, it could, it can have poor uh, boundary resolution for your um, broad peaks. Um, so if you are just trying to identify a uh, differential, oh. Um, Broad mark, sorry, differential broad mark. What you can do is instead of peaks, uh, generate a set of uh, overlapping windows using, for example, bed tools. Uh, this will essentially bend the genome, and then you can apply the same approach where you just do a recount per each of your enriched regions. Oh, sorry, you can do a recount for each of your windows, and then apply apply a um, apply a statistical test to find enriched regions and use those. Um, there are other tools that are uh, that also try to address this um, broad, broad peak calling problem. Uh, an example would be, would be uh, Sicer2. Um, there are additionally um, certain uh, R packages. Um, this one is called uh, Seesaw that um, tries to use the uh, overlapping genomic window approach to help find um, differential broad peaks. Um, so some other items I would like to, to highlight as you are trying to perform your uh, gypsy analysis is keep in mind um, what Keep in mind of the big picture. What are you after? Or because what we really want is to identify a set of regions to gain insight into a cell's population and um, epigenetic state. Um, even if you find, say, a one, uh, a different, even if you find a differential for, say, a salation, um, based on what we learned from the ENCODE paper, that usually uh, co-occurs with other um, with other uh, measurements. For example, if we found, uh, for example, for the uh, differential twenty seven oscillation, we can learn a lot more by looking at, for example, uh, K four monomethylation to identify if it is an active enhancer. Um, if it is an active enhancer, um, you would usually see that chromatin accessibility is also increasing at the location to allow for uh, recruitment of, uh, say, transcription factor. Uh, speaking of transcription factor, you might see increases in, of uh, that. Um, additionally, if it is a newly formed uh, 27, sorry, if it is a newly formed enhancer, does it have any consequence uh, downstream to the disallete regulated gene that is, that is acting upon? Do you see increase in transcription, for example? Um, another idea to also keep in mind is uh, ultimately we want to link our epigenetic state change to some sort of functional genomic feature. So say, for example, um, you called your K4ME3 peaks, you found your dif differential K4ME3 peaks, and then you intersected them with your uh, promoters. And essentially what you have are a set of promoters with uh, differential K4ME3 events. Um, that is one method, but uh, perhaps a quicker way to get that result is if we just looked at our uh, genomic features directly, uh, count 
did a count uh, found and found a, sorry, did a count for K4 ME3 and, um, and applied a, the, um, sorry, applied the, um, the workflow of counting how many uh, K4 ME3 reads are there and applying a full change and a significance threshold to just gain, to just get uh, um, differential all K4 ME3 promoters. So that will give us the uh, same result, essentially. And also uh, consider the computational cost. Um, as uh, Martin highlighted, bed tools and genomic overlap is sort of the uh, first uh, step, is sort of the first way to start exploring your data. It's also one of the fastest ways. But as we've highlighted, there are some uh, caveats to that. Um, edge R, diff bind, um, all of these are packages in R. Um, R isn't known for speed, and it can have trouble um, wrangling large data sets if you have a lot of them. So you might have to come up with, um, sorry, you may have to come up with uh, workarounds such as um, doing the counts, the uh, overlock counts yourself, and then supplying that into R to perform your analysis. Um, another item I would like to uh, highlight is called the uh, um, when you're doing analysis for, say, a taxi, and also surprisingly uh, applicable for ChipSeq is the idea of uh, irreducibility discovery rate. Um, so the uh, sorry, so the idea here is asking the question of um, if. I have two technical replicates or two biological replicates or even um, pseudo replicates. So I, uh, for example, I subset my library down to 90% and compare. How often am I able to call that same read? Or sorry, how often am I able to call that same peak? So in, uh, the, val in the diagram A and diagram B, um, the idea is that your, regardless of, uh, to regardless of depth in your two uh, technical replicates, biological replicates, or pseudo replicates, your signal, your relative uh, signal should always be the same or be similar or along this diagonal. And so your uh, your sorry your let's say you subsampled your peak. And then the signal jumped from um, uh, originally here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it, it deviated off the uh, diagonal. Uh, this would suggest that it is subjective to um, sampling. And that means it's not highly rep uh, reproducible. Um, similarly, if we were to look at it based on ranking, um, you would expect your one of your top peaks to be consistently, uh, you would expect your peak to be uh, ranked the top regardless of uh, whether it was a, um, whether your library is at um, the normal depth or if it is 90% depth, if it vastly changes, it can, if it vastly changes, that might suggest that that peak isn't particularly reproducible. Um, so this is an example of a good library that has a high reproducibility. A example of a poor, of a sorry, of a um, example with low reproducibility is that, as you can see, um, after you uh, subsample your peak, a, the signal vastly changes and isn't doesn't scale accordingly. And even in terms of rank. If your um, peak, uh, for example, was ranked ranked uh, midway point, but then it, after you subsample it, it falls to the wayside all the way to the bottom. It might suggest that, again, that this peak isn't particularly reproducible. And the reason I would like to highlight uh, this particular uh, set of software to use for um, attack seek is because, again, your attack seek doesn't have um, background. So applying this IDR threshold could be another way to get 
to have a more high confidence set of peaks. Um, so uh, a few more items I want to highlight. Uh, Deep Tools is a uh, awesome tool with a lot of um, fe uh, rich uh, features. Um, like uh, Max2, it can generate big wigs where you can then use those big wigs to produce uh, figures. Um, one figure I would like to highlight, uh, you might see very often is the uh, meta plot and uh, this heat map, the idea of this heat map is each row would be your uh, set in of uh, your set of peaks. And then the heat here would just indicate the uh, normalized coverage at those peaks. So uh, TSS and TES would just be the start and end of your peak. And then uh, you can see that it extends a little outwards from uh, those regions. Uh, using this, you can um, demonstrate uh, the peaks that have low strength or sorry, low signal, the peaks that have high signal. Um, you can use this to compare across uh, various marks. So the idea it would be, uh, let's look at this one, for example, you can see that this one would be, uh, if you were to look at this particular replicate, for example, um, this replicate would be showing uh, no, uh, sorry, would be showing no signal at these peaks, while uh, the red replicate be, would be showing uh, a lot of signal at these high peaks. Um, this particular, uh, oh, sorry, I also forgot to mention, uh, this is the meta plot. This is just a summary of all the information here, just to denote the trend. Um, this particular analysis is also useful for doing QC. Um, so for example, if you're, if you supplied, uh, instead of peaks, you supplied, um, region, uh, promoter regions at say the T T uh, TSS, we typically expect to see enrichment at um, the uh, T TSS for K4 ME3. If that deviates, that might suggest um, either a reflection of biology or something went wrong, such as a sample mix up, for example, and etc. cetera, et cetera. Um, Deep tools is also good because you can use that to uh, do a correlation plot. Uh, this will give you a dendrogram, and then you can see the correlation between uh, sorry, so this is a heat map. You would see, you would see the correlation across between all your marks. Um, so this is useful in when comparing uh, a set of narrow marks, they tend to be more closely associated. Um, broad marks tend to be um, off by themselves. Um, so this is good for doing, uh, again, QCing to see expected relationships. Uh, I do wanna warn that if you are incorporating uh, multiple sample types, uh, the biological difference, differences tend to overwhelm the, uh, um, sorry, the biological differences can tend to overwhelm the uh, histomarks in certain cases. Um, additionally, uh, the, assuming that you uh, understand ChIP-seq and you know what you understand ChIP-seq, you know the steps, you know what analysis to do. Um, but let's just say you don't have the time to uh, come up with all the scripts, all the scripting and coding yourself. Um, uh, various consortia have uh, already designed uh, ChIP-seq, so you can analyze them in the same way that these uh, consortia have. Uh, the plus benefit of doing that is you can then use the outputs and compare it to the outputs that the consortia has generated, and then uh, they would both be gener they would be both be um, analyzed in a uniform manner. Um, so here I'm just highlighting the um, chip seek pipeline developed by Encode uh, that Martin and I believe uh, Guillaume is part of uh, the uh, tech seek uh, pipeline. Um, you should see a lot of uh, familiar elements, such as um, you have your reads. You uh, align your reads, you, uh, uh, you mark duplicates, you sort, you take your alignments, you send it into max2, and then you derive your uh, peaks. Um, another set of uh, pipelines I would like to highlight if um, ENCODE wasn't your flavor, um, NFCore 
also has a set of uh, pipelines, um, uh, each for ChIP-seq and another one for attack-seq. Again, uh, you would see a lot of this familiar elements, uh, FastGC to just uh, take a look at your files, uh, BWA to perform alignment, uh, Picard to um, uh, mark dupe filtering, and uh, somewhere along here is max2 to call your enrichment. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, consider the types and kinds of questions that you can ask when you are comparing your peaks across different kinds of experiments. Um, one of the first analyses you can do is just use bed tools to compare overlaps and find uh, to find overlaps and unique peaks. Um, the general methodology for uh, utilizing amplitude when comparing your peaks is to have a unified peak set, um, get contextualize that with read counts, have a signal data frame, and then perform uh, um, uh, some sort of statistical analysis to get your differential peaks. Uh, we also briefly talked about ways we can handle triplicates um, regarding how you can um, find your differential peaks. You can use bed tools for the genomic intersect. You can feed your um, signal data frame to edge R or diff bind, for example. And I hope I also was able to highlight some of the considerations and complexities that you may encounter when you are working with uh, peaks. Um, so I think this is a good part where I can ask any questions.